Welcome to the last section in our journey through the book of Ezra. In a few weeks' time, I am hoping to start a series in John's Gospel. And so if you would like to watch videos from that series, then I encourage you to subscribe to my channel. You'll get notifications when new videos are posted. And if you find these helpful, then please do share them with others, make comments. I'm just going to show you in this text again some of what I've seen. I call this sermon, Repentance is the Only Remedy. We are going to be looking at the whole of chapters 9 and 10. So I do encourage you to read through the whole lot and have a look at what's going on in this section. In many ways, as we get to the end of Ezra, it's like being on a roller coaster journey with all the ups and downs that we've seen. And then the roller coaster almost feels like it jars to a halt as we get to this final section. So do just take some time to pray and ask God to help you to see what is happening in his word here. Um, ask him to give you understanding. May his spirit be at work in you as you dig into his word. And as always, I'm just going to show you a few of the things that I've noticed in this text that I hope will be a help to you. I'm just going to start with the tool that I, I used for this passage, the plot arc tool. That is often just useful for looking at a passage like this. So this is a useful tool just to try and organize the flow of the text and to try and see where the climax of the story is. As I've looked at the passage, uh, verse 1 and 2 of chapter 9 just set the setting for us. See this report of unfaithfulness comes to Ezra. Verse 3 to 15 of chapter, two, uh, chapter 9 we see Ezra's prayer and that really sets up the conflict for us where we see Ezra is showing just how devastating this unfaithfulness to God is. God has been so faithful to them and yet they remain unfaithful. In 10 verse 1 to 4 we get the people gather around him and say, yes, they've been unfaithful and they vow to fix the problem. And I saw that as the climax of the story. And then it resolves itself in 10 verse 5 down to verse 16 or 17, where the exiles led by Ezra conclude that they must separate themselves from their foreign wives. And then from verse 18 through the whole list, you just see who these people are who, who have offended in this way and gives us our, our new setting at the end of the book. We actually, you, you end the book with a bad taste in your mouth as we see that all of these people had married foreign women that had some children with these wives. Now, as we dig into the text, I'll hopefully show just why this is such bad news. So starting from the beginning of the passage, just some key uh, high, uh, repetition in the story that helps us to see what's happening here. This idea of God's people being unfaithful is one of the key things that we'll see throughout this. It's either spoken of as unfaithfulness um, or their sin or their guilt. They've been unfaithful, but they also speak of our sins, or we have forsaken the commands. And as a result of this unfaithfulness, they then speak of their great guilt. Because of their sins, our guilt has reached the heavens. So, the people are shown to be a guilty people because of their unfaithfulness. And what is this unfaithfulness? Well, they have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples. Now, we need a bit of Old Testament background on this. We've been told that Ezra was a teacher of the law of Moses and if you go and dig into Deuteronomy 7, for example, they are told not to intermarry with the people of the land. 
because of their detestable practices. They were told that these people would lead them astray. And Ezra would have been teaching the law of Moses. They would have picked this up. And now these leaders come to Ezra and say, we, we've messed up. We've done this again. We haven't kept ourselves separate from the people of this land. And we have married the woman. passage ends by speaking of all of these have married foreign women and some had had children by these wives. Now we've got to try and set up why is this such a bad thing and if you dig in to the text you'll see a couple of things so um, they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, and they've mingled the holy race or the holy seed. And this idea of the seed, it's the same word that we see in uh, Genesis 3, um, verse 15, the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. And in Isaiah 6, the seed. So in God's word to his people, so Deuteronomy 7 is a good example of this, where God had commanded them to separate themselves, to keep themselves holy, this holy race, to not mingle. But the problem is these people have done that. They have mingled. And their unfaithfulness here, this is the Hebrew word ma'al, which is an extremely strong expression for uh, abandonment of faith. They have abandoned their faith with God and... In Ezra's prayer, he speaks a number of times about them as a remnant. God, in his grace, had kept them as this remnant. But they, the, the remnant was meant to be a holy remnant, God's separate people, to display God's holiness to the world around them. But this remnant is being defiled. And... We see Ezra's reaction to this news is massive. I tore my cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard. He speaks about his self-abasement. His tunic and cloak are torn. And he falls to his knees and he prays. And in his prayer, as he's praying, people gather around him. And as he's praying and confessing, weeping, we see that a large crowd gather around him and they too weep bitterly. So the people around them see the issue. Ezra himself ate no food, he's fasting and mourning because of this unfaithfulness. We might dig in and say, but why such a big reaction? Why isn't this an overreaction? But as we think back over the story of Ezra, we've seen that God has been faithful. God has in bringing his people home to rebuild the house of God. That's been a focus. These people wanted to live God's way in God's place. That's why God had brought them home. The whole first part of the book is about them rebuilding the temple. And then the second half of the book is Ezra himself coming to rebuild the people, to establish them as a people living God's way. But then we get to the end of the book and... Although God has been faithful, they have been unfaithful. And there's this massive contrast that we see throughout this section. Um, he says, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us this remnant. Uh, God has not forsaken us. He has shown us kindness, granting us new life back in the land given them a wall of protection. So God has been gracious. He has been kind. He is protecting his people. Verse 13 here, you have punished us less than our sins deserve. Grace. God's great faithfulness in bringing them home. God had given them, them this remnant. He had brought them home. And 
as they would have read prophecies like in Ezekiel chapter 11, uh, you can go and dig into Ezekiel 11 and just see how God had promised to bring this remnant home. And so God had fulfilled that promise. But Ezekiel 11, 11 goes further by saying that God would also give them new hearts, hearts that would know him and love him and live his way. And that surely hasn't been fulfilled yet because we see the unfaithfulness of God's people and it's contrasted starkly with God's faithfulness in this section. God is the hero of the book of Ezra. Ezra calls him the Lord my God, my God, the Lord our God, our God. It's a very personal language that Ezra uses throughout this section. Our God, our God. And he's realizing God has done so much for his people and yet they have forsaken him. And if you get to verse 15 here, it kind of summarizes the, the predicament that they're in. Verse 15, Lord, the God of Israel, you are righteous. You have left this day. You have, we are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt. And because of it, not one of us can stand in your presence. So God has brought them home. The house of God is built. But they realize they're still guilty. Their hearts haven't been changed. The spirit isn't in them as Ezekiel 11 prophesied. And so they can't even stand in the presence of their holy God. But what we do see is that these are people who are trembling at the words of God. Um, they they want to live God's way. That is their desire. But at the moment, those who, they are those who fear the commands of God. But something is desperately wrong with the people. They are unfaithful. We see the key thing in this section is not so much that they've married these foreign wives, but that those foreign wives have continued with their detestable practices. And that's repeated a couple of times just shows us that, that is the key issue here. If you think about Moses had married um, a foreigner and Boaz married Ruth, the Moabites, um, the Moabites are mentioned here. But in that case, if you think about Moses' wife and then Ruth, the Moabites, they became followers of the God of Israel. But that's not the case here. These wives continue with their detestable practices and they're leading their husbands to do the same. And so that is the big issue. They are mingling the holy race. This remnant isn't remaining as a holy remnant, which they were meant to be. And so, although throughout this book we've seen God's grace, God's kindness, God's protection, God has been faithful to his people in bringing them home, Ezra ends with this terrible feeling in your gut that there's got to be more. You need, you can't have the book ending in verse 44, but that is where it ends. They're sending their wives away because of the unfaithfulness. And the, the whole situation in in these verses just show they were greatly distressed. So all Israel gather in this section, they call together and to deal with this issue. And then we see they gather in this square in the house of God and they're greatly distressed by the occasion and because of the rain. It's a dreadful picture that they are just sitting there in the rain, in their guilt. They're sitting, they can't stand before their God. And... Then they send their wives away. And you kind of, is that how this book ends? Yes, that's how this book ends. So you really need the phrase. It's like the end of an episode that needs the words to be continued. But this book does end with Ezra weeping. He is weeping because of the unfaithfulness, uh, the sin of his people. And that weeping continued. For the next 
400 years, the people kept on saying, how long, Lord? When is this going to happen that our hearts are going to be changed? And so 400 years later, another leader of God's people also walked into Israel, into Jerusalem. And as he walked into Jerusalem, we're told in Luke 19 that Jesus wept. He wept because of the unfaithfulness of his people. But Jesus walked into Jerusalem different to Ezra. He could actually do something. Although Jesus also wept, he had come to deal with the unfaithfulness of his people. And so as this book finishes and you kind of need the words to be continued, the story of the cross ends with the words, it is finished. And as Ezra's prayer ends by saying, here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it not one of us can stand in your presence. The story of the cross ends by saying, here we are before you, and our guilt has been washed away by the blood of Jesus. And only because of Jesus we can stand in the presence of God forgiven. This should be something that we rejoice in. And if you want to go and just dig into a few passages in the New Testament that help us to rejoice in this fact, then Romans 5 is a great one to go and dig into where we see that we've been justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus and we can now stand. And then if we want to think further about the fact that we remain an unfaithful people, we still sin, we don't always live God's way, but we have been given these new hearts. We have God's spirit in us and God is at work changing us. It's worth digging into 1 John, verse 8 and 9. Uh, You could carry on into chapter 2 where we are told that he is faithful. He is just. He will forgive us our sins. So, although, yes, we do see their unfaithfulness continuing, we can rejoice in our Lord Jesus that he came to do what Ezra never could. And because of Jesus, we can now stand in the presence of God. Well, as you dig into this further, it's worth really pushing people to deal with their unfaithfulness seriously. And the way to do that is to confess it before our God, to ask him to to forgive you through Jesus. Well, God bless as you dig in further.